All right, so I just want to go through all the clues that we have to the solar system's origin in order to piece together its origin story. So like I said at the top, I consider this kind of like a forensics idea where you're hunting for clues to explain the past. And so the first of our key clues are these coplanar orbits. Uh, we just discussed that, so I'm not going to go into it any more than I just did. The second key clue is the composition and structure of the planet. So let's talk about that in a little bit of detail. Um, I'll start outside uh, the outer planets with the gas giants um, with their composition and structure. So um, all of them have atmospheres that contains gas, but it's not exactly the type of gas like we think of being you know, fairly rarefied like air, but instead it's compressed and liquefied. So your book says maybe it's more appropriate to call these our liquid giant planets. Um, most of the gases in their atmospheres are uh, composed of hydrogen and hydrogen containing compounds. And like the um, composition of the sun, uh, Jupiter, for example, is about 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. Each of the giant planets has a solid core of uh, some rocky material, some metallic material, material but mostly ice. Um, and those solid cores um, like I said before, aren't just something that you could dive down to through the liquid and then land upon. There's more of a, a kind of smooth transition from a more liquid uh, sort of less dense state to more and more density as you get closer inside the planet. Uh, the reason for that is because they are very large and their own gravity causes them to uh, become compressed as you dive deeper in. So we have actually, um, flung some probes into these planets. Uh, for example, the satellite Cassini um, did, made, did all kinds of flybys of Saturn and Saturn's moons and got all kinds of gorgeous pictures of its rings uh, from which we've learned a lot about the mechanics of objects in those rings. And it kind of did what it, what's called a death dive where it, uh, its orbit spiraled closer and closer in until the probe actually dove straight into the atmosphere and then its instruments kept feeding out information until it was destroyed by the pressure. Uh, so there's a cool documentary about that if you're curious about it and all the pictures are gorgeous. Okay, so moving towards some of the smaller bodies, um, the asteroids, which are between those uh, giant planets and the terrestrial planets, those are mostly made of rocky materials and they tend to be irregular in shape. So unlike our spherical planets, they have you know, not uh, enough gravity to organize themselves into a sphere, which is why most of the planets are spherical in shape. They have enough gravity to pull all the parts into that shape. Um, comets, on the other hand, like I described before, they're dusty snowballs. So they're mostly icy materials with a small trace amount of rocky material. And these are mostly out in the Oort cloud, but occasionally there will be some sort of gravitational perturbation that will throw them into the inner solar system and then we can enjoy the tail of evaporating material that they leave behind. So Comet Neowise this summer was particularly awesome to observe. Um, it had a really obvious tail even with the naked eye. Okay and now moving inward toward the terrestrial planets, this is where we find our heavy rocky and metallic materials. So about two thirds of all of our terrestrial planets are made of silicate rocks, meaning they contain silicon and oxygen. And about one third of those are iron, nickel, or iron sulfur compounds. So most of the metals in these are iron and then there's traces of other materials as well. All right. Um, so that's composition, but when I talk about structure, what I'm talking about is what does the planet look like on the inside if we were going to cut into it, right, and take a cross section. And so all of the terrestrial planets are differentiated, meaning that they have layers. And these layers were separated by gravity um, while the planet was still molten. And so the heavier materials tend to be in the core. Our core is made of iron and the lighter materials like silicates remain near the surface rather than sinking toward the center of the planet. Um, and then this structure freezes into place as the planet cools uh, from the outside in as the heat is able to be radiated out into space. So our crust is a solid, our mantle is still liquid, 
and um, the outer core is, I think it's somewhat solid. The inner core is a rapidly spinning liquid. So the, um, you know, the phase, whether these are solid or liquid, depends both on how, uh, how much the planet has cooled, so the temperature, but also on the pressure. Okay. So we'll see that all the terrestrial planets are differentiated, but each of them have different amounts of these layers. We'll talk about Earth's differentiation on Wednesday. Okay, so when differentiation is happening, what happens to the density? During the process of differentiation, uh, it does depend on whether or not the object is interacting with other objects. So uh, if the, like Tyler said, if the planet, it basically contains all the material that it will ever have, then the process of differentiation won't have any effect on its density. But if there are other objects that could interact with this object, for example, the moon's uh, precursor smashing into the earth, that could very well add material or take material away. So there could be massive volume density uh, changes that cause density changes. So uh, the early solar system is a violent place. Collisions are commonplace. And most of those collisions add mass to the planet. So, um, if I consider you know, the process of differentiation in isolation, then the density will stay the same. But otherwise it could go either way. All right, um, so which of the following places is most likely not to be differentiated? So an asteroid is likely not to be differentiated. And the reason is, well, for one thing, um, it's you know, a very small irregular body. Um, formed of a single material. And the most important thing though is that it was never molten. So this comes back to the solar system formation model. And this is how the idea of differentiation tells us about what happened in the past because um, the planets as they formed and sort of coalesced out of materials that were freezing out in our, um, in our the gas cloud around the sun, which is called the solar nebula. As those materials froze out in little chunks, they started to stick together into what we call planetesimals. Those then continued to merge with each other as objects collided early in the universe, or sorry, early in the solar system, until they became planets. And those collisions were so violent that the impact caused those planets to melt. And so the reason that planets uh, can become molten and differentiate is because of those collisions. And if a small asteroid is you know, still small, then it was never um, impacted by an impactor large enough to cause it to become molten. Um, that also influences the shape because if an object does become molten, then gravity is likely to pull it into a spherical shape. If it's not molten, then, there's no, then it can be irregularly shaped and many asteroids are. So these were not molten, therefore they didn't have a chance to differentiate because that solid material can't just migrate unless it's in the molten phase. Okay. All right, so that's our second clue to the solar system's origin is composition and structure. So we see that composition uh, can tell us maybe something about the solar cloud since it seems that the uh, planets on the inner part of the solar system are made of generally heavier elements than the planets on the outer side of the solar system. Uh, the structure gives us a clue that the, um, there must have been collisions that enabled planets, the terrestrial planets specifically, to become molten. And so that structure, the differentiation, gives us a clue that there were lots of collisions early on. And so collisions must have been an important part of planetary formation. So our third clue is looking at the surfaces and the ages of bodies in the solar system. And this again gives us clues about history uh, because we can see you know, that things happened on these surfaces. We can see evidence of huge impacts. Uh, this is another reason that we believe that the early solar system was very violent and full of collisions. So let's see a little bit more detail about what we learn from planetary surfaces. Um, the first salient feature is looking at the craters on a surface. And one simple thing to do with craters is just count them and see how many craters there are per unit area. And so what would doing that tell us? Unanimously D that the number of craters per unit area on a surface is roughly proportional to the age of the surface we are examining. And that's exactly right. So if we consider the moon specifically, um, 
like I said before, it is most likely that its origin was that it was the product of a collision between the Earth and some type of proto moon, and the uh, you know newly born object would have been molten, and as it cooled, it would have been smooth. And the only thing to make it not smooth is cratering. And so then the number of craters, if you just count them, if there's more craters, then it seems like more time has passed from that original smooth surface state to its current um, cratered state. Um, so the number of craters can tell us the age of the surface, but it doesn't necessarily tell us the age of the overall object. And that's because there's another factor that comes into play other than just cratering. So if you have a smooth surface in the solar system, what is a possibility for why it might be smooth? Okay, so I'm seeing most votes for C, which is correct. So a smooth surface could be brand new, but it could also mean that craters could have been erased on that smooth surface by some sort of geological activity. And by geological activity, I mean things like volcanism and earthquakes. And volcanism in particular can erase craters because if there's a volcanic event and there's some sort of flow of material, then that flow can fill in craters, right? Um, even if you don't have volcanism in particular, um, think of the earth, uh, we'll get to this on Wednesday, um, but it has uh, plates that move around and sometimes the one plate will dive underneath another. So old material will be reincorporated into the mantle and so then new material will have to come from somewhere and that the place it comes from on our planet is sea, force, sea floor spreading. And so that new material is going to be smooth no matter how it's created, whether it's created by volcanism or by plate tectonics. Okay, so that's how we um, use surfaces to tell us about the history of the solar system. We can say that the more craters there are on average, then the older that object surface is and then we can say if there are not craters, if it's smooth, then that gives us a hint that this object has some sort of geological activity uh, making the surface of the planet younger, even as the you know, planet itself might be older or moons. So there is geological activity on many of the moons in our solar system, um, not our own anymore. <laughs>